Hello and welcome to Scientific American's Best of the Blogs video for April 2013. I'm Dr. Karen Bondar and I'm happy to tell you that this month our blog family got a lot bigger with the addition of several new blogs, all to do with diverse fields in psychology. In fact, I'll be introducing three of our new Scientific American Mind bloggers in this episode, starting with the beautiful Melanie Tannenbaum. Oh, hold on. I, sh I should have said beautiful. I mean, she is beautiful, but that's not, that's not really the point. I mean, it's, you know, she looks fine or whatever, but it, you know, her write, it's, it's really, I guess it's more about her writing than her beauty. There's been a lot of discussion lately after recent events in the news about whether or not statements that sound kind or sound like a compliment might be a form of sexism. So this month I wrote about benevolent sexism, which is a phenomenon that's been studied widely in the social psychology literature. Um, and broadly it finds that in contrast to more hostile sexism or more obviously malevolent comments about women, benevolent sexism, things commenting on appearances or stereotypes that women are more caring or nurturing than men, even though they might sound kind, they still serve to undermine women within society by undermining their power and authority or ability to do things as competently as men. And even when controlling for levels of hostile sexism endorsement, we still find that countries with high levels of um, benevolent sexism endorsement, so people who tend to agree with benevolently sexist statements, this tends to map onto higher levels of nationwide gender inequality as measured by things like purchasing power, literacy rates, education levels, things like that. And because they sound objectively kind, many people aren't as in inspired to fight against it or to try and combat benevolent sexism in their everyday lives because it doesn't really seem like that much of a problem. It just seems like a compliment. So in this way, it can actually be quite dangerous because even though it does have real consequences for gender inequality and it makes it more difficult for women to get ahead, at the same time, since it seems nice, it doesn't necessarily inspire people to actually take action against it and try and fight these stereotypes in everyday life. Society places such value on the calculation of an IQ, but what if this number isn't really the best predictor of achievement or intelligence? This month on his new blog, Beautiful Minds, Scott Kaufman sets the record straight about whether or not the IQ is an accurate predictor of achievement. Within a school setting, we've known for years that the best outcomes for learning and retention occur when the learner is actively involved in learning the material and employs specific active strategies to excel. We've also long known about the importance of characteristics such as motivation, deliberate practice, and other active strategies that takes you out of your comfort zone and facilitates growth and development for elite performance in a variety of fields, from the arts to the sciences to sports. In recent years, there's been a marriage of these two approaches, and characteristics such as intrinsic motivation and specific active learning strategies such as actively seeking information, seeking assistance from peers, reviewing the textbook, reviewing notes, etc., have been shown to predict learning outcomes above and beyond the effects of IQ test performance. Now this latest research really excites me because Matthew effects are very prominent in schools. Those with high intrinsic motivation and effective learning strategies will tend to increase their ability, while those without those characteristics will tend to decrease their ability. Over time, the gap between those with higher ability and those with lower ability will widen, which is all the more reason well, I think we ought to create learning conditions for all students that encourages interest, active engagement with the material, and teaches students the most effective learning strategies that they can apply to a wide variety of learning situations that they'll face throughout the rest of their lives. Dogs in pantyhose. Am I the only one that's totally creeped out by this? Like, is this a good idea? I mean, sure, they're man's best friend, but... Is this not taking things a little too far? I'm going to turn it over to Julie Hesch at her new blog, Dog Spies, where she's going to tell us a little bit more about the pop culture surrounding dogs in pantyhose. Dog owners in China recently started a fad of dressing their dogs up in pantyhose and posting the photos online. As you can imagine, many are very upset about this, particularly objecting to the sexualization that is implied by dogs in pantyhose. But dogs don't understand our human construct of sexualization. So the question very quickly becomes, what do pantyhose mean for dogs? First, as you might imagine, Pantyhose can be incredibly constricting. They can hinder normal movement and, of course, excretion. So a dog would not want to be in pantyhose for an entire afternoon. But secondly, if you look at the photos, you'll notice that there's no rips, there's no major holes. So the dogs are not vehemently resisting when their owners are dressing them up. So what do these two things suggest? 
Pantyhose might be just as uncomfortable for dogs as any of the other clothing, any of the myriad of other clothings that we're putting them in. Additionally, dogs are letting particular people put them in this getup, suggesting that a relationship might be behind dogs in pantyhose. And studies actually support this. Dogs extend different levels of tolerance to different people that they do or don't know. So while humans might definitely recoil at this idea of dogs in pantyhose, it's worth acknowledging the dog's perspective. Dogs don't know the difference between pantyhose or long johns or something that was bought in the uh, apparel section at the doggy boutique. But additionally, just because dogs don't vehemently oppose does not mean that they like it. They might just like us. Now, of course, there was a lot of action on our main blog networks this month as well. On SciVid, I profiled the work of Wilson Lamb, who is an undergraduate student of biochemistry at the University of Ottawa. Wilson created this amazing parody of Thrift Shop by Macklemore and Ryan Lewis, biochemistry style. I'm gonna pop some carbs, I've got a little glucose in my breath way. I, I, I'm busy looking for some co-work, this is freaking awesome. Now I got some glucose, hell yeah, I'm in that pep phase. I'm so pumped doing work with hexokinase. Glucose to the glucose with the number 6 phosphate. PGI to that fruit of 6 phosphate. Damn. ATP, ADP, phosphofructokinase E. Once it's biz, FPP, auto lace to GAP, GAPDH with some PGK and PGM. PP to the 2 phosphoglycerate and then... This month, over on Tetrapod Zoology, Darren Nash welcomes us to the Squamazoic, a hypothetical era dominated by none other than squamates. What exactly are squamates? Well, I'm going to let Darren tell you about it. So 65 million years ago, the Mesozoic era ended and the non-avialan dinosaurs won no more. Mammals were also severely affected by this event. But squamates, that's lizards, snakes, and pispanians, they sailed through with minimal casualties and they went on to inherit the earth. Today the world is dominated by squamates. We are living in the Squamazoic era. Squamates are the dominant vertebrate group on the planet. They exhibit incredible diversity and they include large and gigantic species. Now, of course, I'm describing life in an alternative timeline. This is an exercise in speculative zoology. Building hypothetical worlds inhabited by hypothetical creatures is not only a lot of fun, it can also lead us to ask many good and sensible questions about the successes and failures of different animal groups, about the possibilities and limits of evolution, and also about the ways in which communities, ecosystems, and animals themselves can and do function. Will switching to nuclear power over the use of fossil fuels really save over 7 million lives? A recent report released by NASA's Goddard Institute suggests that might be the case. Ash Jagalakar from the Curious Wave Function has some details for us. A new paper from NASA's Goddard Institute, authored by Pushkar Karecha and James Hansen in the journal Environmental Science and Technology, estimates the number of lives saved by replacing fossil fuel sources with nuclear power. The results are quite striking. According to the analysis, about 1.8 million lives have been saved by replacing fossil fuel sources with nuclear during the last 40 years. The study also estimates the saving of up to 7 million lives in the next four decades, along with substantial reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, if nuclear were to replace fossil fuel usage on a large scale. What is even more starkly clear is that the number of deaths caused by nuclear power in accidents like Chernobyl and Fukushima are far lower than the number of lives saved by it. In addition, the study finds that the proposed expansion of natural gas using technologies like fracking would not be as effective in saving lives and preventing pollution. The conclusion of this report is that nuclear power should be an important part of the energy mix if we want to reduce CO2 emissions and prevent pollution-related deaths. Well, that's it for Scientific American's Best of the Vlogs for April 2013. I'm Dr. Karen Bondar, and I'll see you again in May. I'ma do with TCA, I'ma do with TCA, no for real, moving on, can I have some AKA? Citrus synthase from that co-way to that citrate, A kind of taste, step two, isocitrate. I had some NAD+, I used some NAD+, I made some NADH, and avocado glutal gram, dehydrogenase complex, plus some CO2, NADH out, sucks my co-way, then I take that GDP.